I think the story I preferred in my career as a journalist is a story about everyday life, about everyday justice in Haiti. It's not a story about big events. Uh, I remember covering the trial of a woman who was um, the wife of a guy who was uh, uh, you know, pushing a wheelbarrow in the market and was uh, carrying stuff. The man was a heavy drinker, would beat her repeatedly, and uh, she was there on trial for killing him. And uh, what I saw in that courtroom was uh, a confrontation of two cultures the cultures of the West. She was being tried in French in a court of law, and she did not understand why they were trying her. She was being tried. Uh, the testimonies were in Creole. The lawyers or the judge would translate the, the testimony from Creole to French, while everyone in Haiti understands Creole. And just because uh, and you had, the, of course, the lawyers talking in French, the judge talking French, and that poor woman was there being tried for the, that murder, supposed murder. And uh, we also had the, the clash of two cultures. The woman had thrown three small pebbles on the body of the man. And they said that she had killed her. She couldn't possibly have killed her with those three little rocks. In Haitian popular culture, it's one way of telling the men not to come back as a spirit to come and haunt her again. The three pebbles couldn't possibly have killed the men. And that's what she was being tried for. So it was two countries side by side in that courtroom. And this was the most fascinating story I ever covered had to do with everyday life. It didn't have to do with any big, huge events. Uh, so uh, I think in terms of the station itself, I think what mattered to me the most were, uh, were as I said, investigative stories, because I am trained as an investigative reporter. Um, it was also. Uh, you know, what our reporters were bringing back from the countryside. There was a richness, there was a depth in what was being done in the countryside that was going beyond, uh, you know, covering daily events, uh, uh, you know, shortage of gasoline or, uh, uh, you know, an energy crisis in Port-au-Prince or uh, uh, the latest uh, uh, sparing match in the Senate, you know. Uh, to me, there was so much more, you know, in those stories. What happened to the woman with the pebbles? She was tried, uh, condemned, but she was later freed. But she was condemned to jail, supposedly because she had killed that man. Injustice at work. Could you tell us about interactions you've had with listeners through the years and what? Oh, so that uh, we had a number of um, talk shows where uh, listeners could call in. Uh, we couldn't do that under the, of course, uh, the Duvalier regime, but we certainly could do that uh, in 19, from 1987 on. Uh, people could actually express themselves, and we had a lot of calls. Uh, I also had uh, I had a game show, uh, which was about uh, Haitian history and parts of hist history that that are largely unknown, like uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to just teach kids, not kids, uh, people. Most of the people who actually participated were adults, you know, about Haitian history, fun things, unknown things, you know. And people were calling and calling and calling. One of the uh, questions I was asked when we were presenting uh, the Haiti, uh, Radio Haiti archives uh, at Duke uh, was a question from a listener. What are you doing about the game show? Is the game show going to be part of the, uh, of the archives? I said, no, of course. But uh, it was coming from a listener uh, 
who is a student at Duke and who was wondering uh, because he had been part of that game show for so long. He had been uh, you know, answering questions and being part of it. So uh, there was a lot of interaction, uh, whether it was about political things you know, or whether it was about game shows. Uh, there was always interaction. And then there were, we had interaction in the streets. You know, I mean, we would stop at the, at the, at the gas station to get gas. And Jean would, uh, even though he had his editorials in French, People at the gas station would say, Jean, you talk about this this morning, you know, and uh, I think you should add this, and I think you should say that, even though Jean was doing his editorials in French, mm -hmm. since it was during a French news program. So, you know, the, the, the feedback was always there. The feedback was always uh, uh, coming. Did he take their advice? Well, he listened. Jean listened a lot. He looked like he was... Uh, always talking, but that's what you get in the archives. But uh, I think it was, uh, uh, he listened a lot. He used to say, uh, I have to come back. When he came back to Haiti, he says, something happened in this country I don't understand. Because the, the, uh, the ouster of uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier, and he said, I have to sit down on a small chair and listen to people. As you know, the small chair is what you take when you want to be at the level of people and just while they are sitting down on the ground to listen to their stories. And he did that a lot. Listen. So well, can you tell us about the process of giving this archive to Duke and why why you decided to do it, why you decided to donate the archive now, and what that has meant to you and to others? Well, you know, after the station was closed, there was always the hope that we would go back, that we would start Radio Haiti again. And uh, for me to give away the archives was kind of a definitive gesture, like saying that's it, we're closed. Uh, so I, I waited, I waited quite a while. Uh, when I started looking for a place to host uh, the, the archives, um, I know I couldn't count on any Haitian institutions uh, because, well, they didn't have the equipment, they didn't have the means, uh, and I know how much work it involved because the technology had evolved so much. I mean, we were uh, working in analog, and suddenly uh, we had, uh, you know, digital recordings uh, uh, to be uh, to. That should be that were being done in radio station here in this country, and uh, you know to uh, so first there was the costs of the whole thing, there was also the fact that uh, you know I I uh, listened to I just searched uh, and I found that Duke had a lot of interest in Haiti uh, with the radio lab at uh, Forum uh, for Scholars and Publics. Uh, I read uh, Laurent Dubois' books uh, about Haiti. Uh, I think all this, uh, um, you know, I asked questions to people and I said, uh, should I give the archives to Dukes, to Duke? And the answer I got from a number of people I trusted was, that's the best place. And that's why I did it. That's why I did it. And uh, uh, I contacted Patrick Storsky through uh, the National Coalition for Haitian Rights. They had just donated their own archives to uh, Duke, and I just uh, felt, uh, you know, comfortable doing it. And um, when I, uh, uh, I con contacted Patrick, I think he thought for a little while, asked me a number of questions which I answered uh, about copyrights, about things of that sort, and, um, uh, and I, can, I think he got quite a bit of pressure from different people here that it was an important collection and it was important for Duke to have it. So uh, it was a marriage made in heaven. So <laughs> now it's going to take a while. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult process and I'm sure, uh, you know, it will be, uh, it has been explained before and it will be explained again. Uh, you know, we have tapes that have been, um, that are 30 year, 40 year old tapes that have to be uh, uh, from, go, go from uh, analog to, uh, uh, digital tapes, uh, it's, uh, it's a difficult process. A lot of the tapes have mold, are uh, 
but uh, I was surprised and so exhilarated when I heard the first recordings put on digital. Uh, it's as if Radio Haiti was reborn. And to me, that's the greatest of satisfaction. So a lot of the recordings deal with themes that are still going on um, from you know, Haitian refugees, boat people, um, Dominican-Haitian relations, politics, the ongoing um, search for justice against Duvalier, the ever unfolding saga of Aristide, all of these things are, have been things that Radio Haiti was talking about for decades. When you think back on, on yourself and Jean-Dominique in the 70s and the 80s, beginning to report on these stories, what would have surprised you then about what is happening in Haiti now and how these stories have evolved? Uh, I think how much people changed, and I think this is one of the interesting part about these archives. You have the same politicians that are still politicians in Haiti. You hear them 30 years ago, you hear them 20 years ago, you hear them 10 years ago, and you hear them today. And I think it's going to be a fascinating study of seeing the evolving um, position, I should say, of different chameleons going from one political stand to another, going from being victims of the Duvalier regime to defending the Duvalier regime. You know, there are several things, or the transformation of a, of a man from uh, being uh, a priest, uh, in the case of Jean-Bertrand Aristide, to that same man being president of Haiti, going through a coup d'etat, coming back again as president, his attitudes, his way of thinking, it's a fascinating thing that those archives uh, carry with them. And uh, it's, uh, we have several uh, debates uh, around uh, roundtable uh, discussions with different actors of uh, Haiti's political scenes. The same actors, as I said, are, he are there. And uh, hearing them, them exchange ideas, being from different camps, and then suddenly now being together in the same camp you know, makes for interesting uh, listening. What were your, your goals, your collective, you know, yours and Jean's and the team's goals um, at Radio IT, and do you feel that, that you succeeded? Uh, I do feel uh, that, uh, um, I think yes, definitely we have reached our goals. Uh, you know, those goals uh, became more and more ambitious as we were going along. When there were very limited goals when we were uh, working on the, uh, the Duvalier regime. We knew we couldn't go much further than the, uh, the actual events carried us or the actual existence of that regime carried us. So to us, uh, that, uh, um, that sense of purpose grew even more after the fall of the dictatorship when uh, or after the different coup d'etats, when we felt that, uh, um, you know, we expanded uh, what we wanted. And uh, as people trusted more, trusted us more, and we became the voice of so many, uh, to us, it became uh, like a, uh, you know, it, and it became more and more, uh, uh, we became more and more ambitious about what we wanted to achieve as journalists, as journalists who were actually engaged on the side of a large majority. So it's, uh, uh, <coughs> it's pretty far from the so-called just clearly objective journalism uh, that uh, might have existed in other cultures. Uh, yes, we're trying to be objective, giving different voices uh, uh, the possibility to speak out, but we had left a place where the majority could express themselves freely through those uh, uh, call-in programs. We had left spaces for uh, editorials, which were Jean's edi editorials mostly, then after Jean was killed became my editorials, where we actually analyzed the situation, not at all from, uh, uh, of course, from our point of view, not at all from a so-called objective point of view. That was the work of the newsroom, to do objective reporting about different actors in one event. 
our own, uh, uh, we also left room for analytical uh, 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 voices to come in and say, well, uh, and analyze uh, with us what was happening. What has um, the process of listening to these recordings, again, after many years, over the last few days, uh, been like for you? Very emotional, very draining, and then uh, at the same time, uh, I am so very thankful uh, for uh, those journalists who actually did that work and were in the field. Of course, they enjoyed it. I know they enjoyed it. I did uh, when I was myself a reporter. Um, but beyond that, uh, I, feel, I felt so thankful for uh, and so rewarded by the fact that most of those journalists, I trained myself and I feel in so many ways I succeeded. Uh, I have some, um, I think we have some great stories, uh, and they are the work of one or the other of the reporters. Of course, we did some editing of their work, but it was from them. And it took uh, a lot of uh, sacrifice in, at so many different seasons of our lives uh, for them to keep at it and do it. Would have been easier for them to go and work for another radio station and cover, uh, let's say, uh, uh, social news. And uh, that's not what they were about. And they shared what we wanted. They shared what was important for us. Um, so that is a very rewarding thing, to listen to those tapes. It's draining. It's exhausting. Um, it's, uh, uh, but I think it's beautiful. It's a beautiful time. What would you want people in Haiti, and especially young people who either weren't born or weren't yet old enough to know what it was, to know about, about Radio Haiti? I don't think the, uh, I want them to know as much about Radio Haiti as I want to know them to know about the struggle of so many years. Because they take for granted freedom of the press. They take for granted expressing yourself. They take for granted freedom of association. Even though there are ups and downs, and every once in a while you have uh, you know, a tightening of, uh, of uh, you know, the police reacts to something. Or, but we are more or less in a democratic time. Um, and the young people who come today, they do not know what it has cost. People have died. Journalists have been killed. They have been imprisoned. I want them to know the price paid, not for me, not for the radio, but I want them to know of the price paid uh, so it won't happen again. So we no longer be endangered to lose our freedom of speech. And to me, uh, that's what I want them to know. I want them to know what happened. And uh, there is uh, uh, only recently have uh, been uh, programs or interviews uh, you know, that are uh, about memories of the past, about memories of what happened under Duvalier. It's only recently that it is coming out, 50 years after the dictatorship started. So uh, to me, it's, uh, uh, it is important to let them know. And those archives carry that. And those archives can allow them to put the present into perspective, because finally, they are the same situation. And the way we solve those situations has to be with the light of what happened before, about not making the same mistakes. And I think it's, uh, 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 of course, I know a lot of them. It's because uh, uh, they like to hear, uh, uh, a lot of them as are asking me, they want to hear Jean-Dominique. You know, and a lot of people, um, you know, they have been told by their parents, you know, uh, about John's editorials. Uh, I know some of them, it's, it's that. But for most of them, what I want them to, to know is the price paid. And what would you And want also the enthusiasm. You know, I'm interrupting you because I think it's important to say also I want them to know of the enthusiasm and of the fervor there was behind, uh, behind 1986, 87, when they were too young to know. Uh, they were too young to remember. 
uh, and I want them to know that you know people were mobilized around issues, you know, around justice, and I think it's uh, it's it's important. What would you want people outside of Haiti, non-Haitian listeners, people just coming to hear about Radio Haiti for the first time, maybe people who don't know very much about Haiti? Well, I think uh, our struggle was not a unique one. I think there are other radio stations in uh, throughout the the, the, uh, um, the, the Americas, I know, uh, the Latin, for Latin America, Central America, who have gone through the same thing. So our case is not a unique case. Uh, there are specifics to our story, but our story is one of so many stories. It's about freedom of the press, and a lot of people have had to struggle to get where they got. Uh, it's, uh, it could be uh, a story taking place in Tunisia. It could be a story taking place in a lot of countries in the world, you know, about uh, defending freedom of the press, about expanding the limits of freedom of the press under, uh, you know, a dictatorial regime or afterwards, of protecting that freedom of the press. So it's, I think it goes beyond us, and I think it has a universal appeal a universal meaning, even though it is the story of one radio station. What role do you see this archive playing in active processes of seeking justice and accountability? I think it's important if we can get those archives to be available to everyone, which is one of the things we discuss, and uh, Duke has agreed on this, that we should, as the work is being uh, done, that these archives become increasingly available to people. Uh, to download, uh, to listen to a story, simply listen to it, uh, and we should find ways of getting people to react to those stories that are 20 years old, but that are very current. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's important if not just scholars, not just students at Duke, but people in Haiti, people elsewhere in the Americas can have or elsewhere can have access to those archives. Of course, there is a language issue. Some of them, uh, one part is in French, one part is in Creole. But I think uh, uh, the issues are the same. The issues bring, bring us together, and we should find ways of uh, making these available to anyone who wishes to hear. You've been talking a lot about the movements, the energy um, around 1986, the enthusiasm the feeling of sort of inevitable change. What advice, wisdom would you give to young people, either in Haiti or not in Haiti, um, who, who want to bring about social change in 2014? I think the message is it is possible. Um, People might not, uh, uh, young people might not remember the, 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 the fights we had and the struggle of the, of, uh, uh, the 80s. Uh, however, a lot has happened. And uh, even though people have been numbed by the fact that there have been so many killings and so many people have disappeared, so many, um, and it looks at times like every time we have to start over. After a coup, we have to start over and every time with less enthusiasm because of, uh, of the past. Um, but I think uh, uh, we should remind the, 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 the young people that um, we can bring about change. We have before, and we can move things beyond where we are today in terms of social change, in terms of justice. We are certainly uh, uh, doing it right now. So many people are engaged into uh, the fight for justice. Um, and I think uh, uh, if our uh, work can nourish, nurture that, then it's great. I know you get this question a lot, um, so I'm going to ask it anyway, um, which is, what are your plans now? What are your and you've answered this even within this, but will, will Radio Haiti reopen? And, and what are you going to do for Haiti now? 
Well, I'm, I've never stopped being uh, involved in uh, what happens in Haiti, uh, even though my work took me kind of away from that for a while. I was in Haiti uh, after the earthquake, during the earthquake and after the earthquake. Um, to me, I just was working for Haiti. Um, I keep on doing it now uh, it, through different means, through different ways. Uh, can I reopen Radio Haiti? I think if I reopen, if I were to reopen a station, it wouldn't be the same station. It would be different for a lot of reasons. Circumstances have changed. Um, do I have the means to open a new station? I don't think so. Uh, so it's uh, um, uh, what is comforting is to know that uh, we are still here alive through those archives, and I'm glad we are calling it Voices of Change, because I think. Those archives will remain voices of change. And could you tell us that story about um, about what happened after the earthquake? Oh <laughs> yes. Well, after the earthquake, I was uh, uh, actually just I was in Haiti on vacation when the earthquake occurred. I had gone there to see my mother, so I was not at all there in an official capacity. Radio Haiti had been closed since two thousand and three, uh, and I went down by foot. And uh, I remember, you know, of course, there were bodies all over in the street. And I went all the way down to the central square of Port-au-Prince. And there, uh, there is a man who raised his hand when he saw me. And he says, uh, Jean would know what to do. And uh, uh, if Jean were here, this would not have happened. And I told myself, you know, in the face of those two uh, statements, what does, I said, I, and I said so, I said, what do you think, what can could Jean do? And uh, the man answered, what do you know? Like, you know, hey, you know, this is bigger than you. And, you know, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing because suddenly Jean had become a hero someone who could, for some reason, pushes the plaques away from uh, hitting each other and uh, creating uh, an earthquake. And uh, so those two statements, you know, uh, what would Jean do when uh, this would not have never happened if Jean was he were here, uh, I think was, uh, uh, I smiled, but not openly after that. Questions about Gonaive now? Um, Can you splice it in? That's up to you. Um, the uh, I, I don't know if you answered this just a few minutes ago with um, you talking about other uh, radio stations or other struggles in Latin America, but you had also talked, mm -hmm. and we were talking at some point about how you had reported on struggles elsewhere oh, yeah. as mm -hmm, a way mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. talk yes. about things. Okay. Indirectly. Okay, so yeah. Uh, is that a, yeah, is that mm -hmm. a question for me? Um, during which time? During I, during Duvalier. Yeah. Well, I'll, yeah, I have a longer question about that, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, so you taught me this expression, paleandaki, which is new for me, which I think um, means to talk about something without talking about it directly. And could you talk more about how you did that in the Duvalier years, and especially how you talked about situations, circumstances, events outside of Haiti as a, as a metaphor or as a parallel for what was happening in Haiti? Well, we had to. Uh, there was one way for us to, uh, to talk about the dictatorship and about politics without talking about it. And it was, for instance, covering what was happening in Nicaragua. Uh, with uh, the overthrow of Somoza. And uh, in Creole, there was, uh, uh, it was done by uh, Compe Filo, one of our reporters, uh, and one of the anchors of the 9 o'clock news, who said uh, um, uh, he was talking about Mashwe Wong, means uh, talking about Somoza, uh, talking about how uh, square his uh, jaw was, uh, how, how round, I'm sorry, his jaw was. And uh, um, we kept on talking about Mashwerwon, Mashwerwon, uh, people with dictators with round, uh, and uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier was quite fat. And he had a pretty round 
uh, draw. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, we m people understood that we were talking about Haiti when we were talking about the fall of Somoza, which was so dictators could fall. And in fact, we carried the story all the way. We covered uh, the, uh, the Sandinistas going to, we even had a reporter in, Nica in uh, Managua covering uh, the Sandinistas coming into Managua. Because to us, it was one way of carrying the internal story further by just uh, uh, taking as comparison uh, another dictator. No, let's, uh, can yeah. we finish? I'm done. Yeah.